Um, well, I think I should start this podcast unusually talking a little bit about myself before I introduce my guest, because my podcast is not centered around martial arts. Uh, my podcast is mainly centered around religion, cults, ideologies, but I think my martial arts background has some bearing on the conversation I would like my guest to know a little bit about as well. I started martial arts when I was like 18 months old, according to my parents, because they put me in a Taekwondo school. So this is like 1982. Uh -huh. And after that, when I went around high school, I got more into it. I also started doing Choi Li Foot Kung Fu, Yang style Tai Chi. In college, I was on the Taekwondo team. Then I also started doing boxing, kickboxing, capoeira. Kali stick fighting. I was just into everything. Was never good at any sports with any kind of ball with it. No football, no baseball. I was just good at martial arts. And then after I graduated from college, which I studied film studies and I concentrated on Asian film studies, I went to live in Korea. I coached uh, the Taekwondo team for Yonsei University. I also did Hapkido. And after that, I also uh, started doing jujitsu and MMA, and I had to stop doing Taekwondo because it just messed up my back a lot. Um, and yeah, and I was always very much into Asian film, martial arts film. And due to all this, right from the beginning, especially this is you know early 80s when I started, all my teachers and all the other students were very much into Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee was a very big influence of mine. And recently, I just noticed there there came out a biography of Bruce Lee, which you would think about being a person as famous as Bruce Lee. There would be a lot of biographies about him, but there aren't many, actually, especially not very recent or good ones. And I was lucky enough to get Matthew Polly, the author of Bruce Lee, A Life, on my podcast. And I just read the book. I think it's fantastic. And to tell a little bit more about Matthew, Matthew is also the author of American Shaolin and Tapped Out. He's a graduate from Princeton University, a Rhodes Scholar, and he studied two years of Kung Fu at Shaolin Temple in Henan, China. So I'm really excited to talk with Matthew today. Thank you for being on. Thanks so much for having me on, Lalo. Um, so that, I mean, there's a lot to talk about there, but I mean, mainly, um, I'd like to talk about your book, Bruce Lee, A Life. But before we get to that, I'd like to know more about you because you seem very interesting. Um, well, first I got to say that your story is like the classic Bruce Lee fan story. Very so, fanatical. Very fanatical yeah, when exactly. it was young, yeah. I, you're like my target audience. You're a martial artist, film study guy who hurt his back doing martial arts. You're like, yeah. that's Bruce's story. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I could add in there also that, you know, of immigrant parents who moved to the United States from Chile oh, and I'm biracial. Oh. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, as any Bruce Lee fan, we love to draw parallels <laughs> with this guy. <laughs> Which sounds all ridiculous, but it's enjoyable for us. Yeah, it is. And I, yeah, you cover all the bases, so this is perfect. Um, so I was a, a kind of skinny, bullied 12-year-old when I first saw Enter the Dragon. Uh, and I, I had no idea who Bruce Lee was. Uh, I'd never seen a kung fu movie. And as you have experienced, he just he's so magnetic, he just popped off the screen into my imagination and became kind of sort of my hero. And, uh, and I... I did the similar thing. I, I immediately got into martial arts. Um, I dojo hopped. I did Aikido, Taekwondo, Southern Kung Fu. And I studied religion and East Asian studies in college. So I was reading the same books that Bruce was reading by Alan Watts and DK Suzuki and uh, a lot of the sort of Zen and Eastern mysticism. Uh, and then I you know, heard about the Shaolin Temple. I, I thought it was just something that was made up, uh, but that it really existed. And so I dropped out of college for two years and went to the Shaolin Temple, which is supposedly the birthplace of Kung Fu and Zen Buddhism, 
and uh, spent two years studying uh, kickboxing and traditional kung fu with the Shaolin monks, uh, and then came back to the States and uh, wanted to be a writer. I realized I was a pretty good martial artist, but I was a much better writer, uh, and so started my career, wrote American Shaolin, which was a, about that experience and became a national bestseller, and that launched my career as a martial arts author. The next book, I, I like you, I studied MMA. Uh, I went to you know gyms all around the world, spent a lot of time at Extreme Couture in Las Vegas, had an amateur fight, uh, won it, and wisely decided to retire <laughs> after that. Uh, and you know after that experience, I had like a cracked rib and a broken nose, and so I was looking for a project that uh, didn't involve me getting punched in the face. Uh, and someone suggested writing a biography of Bruce Lee, and my reaction was similar to yours. I, I thought, that's a dumb idea. There must be tons of really good Bruce Lee books because he's one of the you know probably five most famous human beings on Earth. And realized there wasn't. The last one had been written 25 years ago by a very small press, not particularly well-researched. And so it, it offended me as a Bruce Lee fan. Oh, and same here. I was just about to say that to you. I also yeah. find that just incredible. I, I think it's a certain latent racism, personally, that, uh, mm. you know, any white guy gets six biographies who does anything. But uh, Steve McQueen has half a dozen. But uh, Bruce Lee can't get one decent, proper biography. And so, in a way, in my mind, I thought, you know, this is a way I could um, honor Bruce's legacy and pay back the debt I have to him for how he changed my life for the better. And, uh, and so I set on this journey that I thought would take a couple of years and <laughs> ended up taking seven to get down seven years. I was going to ask you how long it took because in your biography, I, you know, I get to the end, I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of book left. There's like a quarter of this book left. It's nothing but notes. It's gigantic. Exactly. Uh, what I wanted to do was, uh, be as comprehensive as possible. Uh, and I also felt like I had two audiences, one, the kind of general public who knows who Bruce Lee is, but doesn't know much more than that. Uh, and then, of course, people like us who are fans who have followed his life and read lots of things about him. And so the the hundred pages of notes at the end are a way of sort of the DVD extras uh, of the book. Um, but I'll, But another important thing was that none of the Bruce Lee books that had ever been written before had any footnotes. And so you had no idea where they were getting these quotes from. Is that true? Their... None of them had footnotes before? No, no, none of them. None of them do. So, you know, there's a lot of things that have been accrued over time that I turned out to be untrue in my research. And that's because one person just copied somebody else who copied somebody else and the original source was wrong. What, what, is, yeah. what other aspects do you consider? I mean, how does it happen that there, there are so few biographies and there hasn't been a comprehensive definitive biography of Bruce considering how famous he is I just I can't comprehend I mean you must have come across some deeper reasons for that in in your research so there are a couple one is that kung fu is considered lowbrow right. um yes and I think and I think that's because it's like one step up from porn and one below horror <laughs> mm-hmm <laughs> And that's because so many sort of bad kung fu movies have been made over the years that it's got a schlocky reputation. Two, I think, uh, I think very specifically um, in American culture, it's it's divided black or white, and Asians are ignored um, in the media landscape. If you try to think of one Asian celebrity. You've got Jackie Chan, maybe. Um, it's very hard to come up with one, whereas there are a lot of white and African-American celebrities. So I think just as a cultural thing, they're ignored. And then as a, you know, just sort of a small note, I, uh, the estate, I don't think, was very interested in having a comprehensive biography done because um, they sort of had a monopoly on Bruce's story. And so I do know that a couple of biographers uh, went to get... Um, asked them for permission and were turned down. And so I think that's that's a, a sort of technical reason why as well. I see. And did you work with the estate, maybe with Shannon Lee? Uh, I talked to Shannon very early on, um, but I got the book deal first uh, and then sort of went as a fait accompli. 
It's instead of asking for permission because I knew I'd be rejected. Uh, and uh, they very graciously, Shannon, gave me an interview and told me a lot about her brother, Brandon, which was very helpful. And Linda very graciously granted me an interview, but it's not an authorized biography. Um, but, you know, everything in it is my own opinions. And, you know, uh, at a certain point in the research, I realized I wasn't going to be able to tell his story in a way that would totally make them happy. I see. But I mean, um, when I first contacted you, uh, I had only read the initial part of the book because I usually don't finish the book unless I'm going to I know I'm going to speak with the the author coming soon. Um and I and I got through the whole book, and I have to say, it is phenomenal. It is it is a fantastic book, so detailed. You, you you really seem like you went through every stop to get every detail right from multiple accounts. It's it's well written, well researched. It's entertaining. I think it has a lot of deeper deeper levels to it, and there's so many things I like about it, including the fact that I my my feelings that you demystified so many things about Bruce that he became a realer person because, mm -hmm. you know, as a Bruce Lee fan, and I think any Bruce Lee fan can relate to this, that to this day, you know, you're still kind of hungry looking for any little piece of information, little radio shows he had done, little articles here and there, very lowbrow do documentaries that, you know, and that's pretty much all there are. Um, right. And they all create this mythos of, of Bruce Lee, this, uh, this fantastic figure that it was almost Jesus like, um, yeah. and, and, you know, most documentaries I'm sure you, that you've seen, um, are very reluctant to maybe say anything bad about Bruce Lee and you don't pull any punches with his biography. You really let out the, how the, the fights maybe weren't as spectacular as one might think they were, they were very quick, you know, a lot of, you know, just snapping to gou trying to gouge out eyes, um, right. not as romanticized and as pretty and choreographed as we see on screen. Um, you know, the, the, the romances and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the playboyness uh, of it all. It's so not a perfect figure, right. but, but also so interesting um, for what he was going deep into the, his philosophy. So, by the end of the book, I felt like I got to know a realer Bruce and, and got to push aside so many of the the fantastical sides to it, clarify all, all these, you know, the, the fights that had become iconic and things like that. So I, I, I think any Bruce Lee fan and even a non-Bruce Lee fan would be fascinated by this book. I mean, you start the book at, at the beginning, which already blew my mind. I didn't even know, I, I don't think I knew that Bruce Lee was biracial, but I definitely didn't know that he even had some Jewish in him. That, that was, that was blew my mind. I started telling everybody I knew, I'm like, did you know Bruce Lee had a, was partly Jewish? <laughs> I, did, I didn't know that either. It's not in any books about Bruce Lee. And in fact, I had written the section and had gone by what everyone else had said, which is that he had a, a German Catholic grandfather. And I did some deep dive and, you know, went through Google and it was in these weird sites and then finally found this book written by um, the, some of Bruce's cousins. Uh, and it, I was just stunned. I ran downstairs and told my wife, Bruce Lee was part Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. Like I, I literally was like, how is it possible 45 years later that no one had uncovered this? And I kept finding that in, in various sort of areas where no one had just done the spade work and gotten, you know, the degree to which he is. He's, he's such an interesting figure. His grandmother was English. His great grandfather was Dutch Jewish. Um, he's a very, you know, he's biracial, he's Eurasian, he's born in America, raised in Hong Kong. He's almost like a post-racial figure. And I find him utterly fascinating. You, I mean, if I can read from your book, just this line where you describe his birth and it, it, it's, it, I mean, just that is really interesting. A healthy baby boy, five eighths Han Chinese, one quarter English, one eighth Dutch Jewish was born at 7.12 a.m., November 27th, 1940. Uh, that, I mean, that's just globalism right there. And it's destiny a little bit that Bruce embodied 
globalism himself that he 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 expanded cultures that were unknown to each other especially at, at, at this time right after world war ii and bridged gaps and you go over that so so many times how people all over the world from iran to bosnia to the united states to europe everywhere japan um you know even his uh, his movies were seemed very anti-japanese those movies still became popular in japan because he just transcended borders and that he he himself was very uh, in this very rare way was this mix of of also race and then he became a mi mix of cultures and i think that's why he was maybe able to bridge that gap in a lot of ways because just like his philosophy later that had no restrictions it was because he wasn't purely even in racial terms or in cultural terms pure he he was a mix which led to all this mixed martial arts in the future I think that's absolutely right. I, you know, you never know how much is culture and how much is genetics, but he had both, which is, uh, you know, he was genetically a mixture of uh, different uh, ethnic groups. And then, of course, um, he grew up in a post colonial in colonial um, Hong Kong, uh, but it was born in America and went back and he kept going back and forth. And I think one of the things that struck me is he's somebody who faced discrimination on both sides. And I tried to draw on some of my experience living in China and then going back to America, that sense of uh, people who do that often feel like they're n neither nor. Um, and I think Bruce, it wasn't just as as the stories have been told that he was treated as Asian or Chinese and American discriminated against, but that even growing up, um, they tried to kick him out of Ipman's class because he wasn't pure Chinese. And then he goes back and he's the biggest star but they, people are criticizing him for being too westernized. And so part of his effort to bridge the gaps were to bridge the gap in his own life, um, that he, he, he was able to be universal, but he was never fully accepted by either side. And I think that's sort of a fascinating aspect of his life is that he, he wasn't considered Chinese enough in Hong Kong and he wasn't, you know, obviously wasn't white in America. And so he never really quite fit in, and yet he never gave up on trying to succeed in both cultures. There's a part in your book that I just found so fascinating that Bruce was able to grow a full beard, which is not right. common of people who are purely racially Asian, East Asian. Yep. And I, yep. I mean, you lived in Asia. I lived in Asia as well. And I, actually, since I'm, you know, <laughs> Arab Latino, I can grow a, a, like a full beard in, in a week, seconds. in thirty <laughs> seconds, you know, before I get before I get my coffee, I already got a full beard. So when I was there, I actually grew a beard once just to show off. Just, I mean, I'm not kidding, you know, just to show I could do it. And right. you you talk about how Bruce very accidentally, just out of you know being in editing rooms and just you know enclosing himself to work on his films, at some point grew this beard. He went to the airport to drop off his wife. Paparazzi took a picture, and people identified that as, oh, you're not fully Asian, and he faced more discrimination by that. I mean, those are stories that are fascinating and show that Bruce Lee just never stopped fighting that hurdle anywhere he was in, in his life. Yeah, I mean, I love that story because it's so very specific. I mean, it's something that uh, the average American would never consider. Um, but having lived in China, I, I could see this, which was, he looked when he grow a beard. He looked like a Mongol, right? And, and in all the films in in China, the Mongols are the bad guys who invaded the the Han Chinese. And so he it by when they saw the beard, it reminded them um, that he wasn't fully Chinese, and it differentiated him. And he was supposed to be the Chinese hero, and so he was criticized for it. But to Bruce's credit, he. He, he joked, he's like, uh, now there's going to be three times as many people with full beards in Hong Kong as before. And I, I, one of the things I really did admire about Bruce and researching him is that he leaned into whatever uh, identity they were trying to discriminate against. So when he was in America, he emphasized how Chinese he was. And when he was in Hong Kong, he emphasized how westernized and American he was. And he would also brag about being Eurasian. And so he was... By being post-racial, it wasn't that he wasn't uh, any identity. It was that he was proud of whatever one they thought wasn't the good one. <laughs> and so I always thought that was a, 
a truly admirable quality. He never he never denied if they said you're you're Chinese, he was like yes, and if they said you're Westernized, he was like yes, and uh, he was he would he would be proud and defend whatever it is they were trying to put down. Uh, I really like how you describe how he never tried to lock himself in and be anyone's servant because I think he also always tried to fight the stereotype of the the servile Asian man. Yeah. So he never tied himself to any company and always wanted that independence until even when he was getting those movie deals where he's just like, Oh, we want to have exclusive rights to, he was like, no, I want to work here. I want to work there. I want to make it. He wants to work with Shaw brothers. He wants to work in golden harvest. He wants to work in the United States. Yeah, no, he, he, I, I think you, you hit it on the head, which is his, uh, his personality. What he was trying to do was to, um, reimagine the Chinese male and Chinese masculinity in part in Western media and create a Chinese hero, which didn't exist. Um, so he was essentially trying to invent a role that had no, we now think about the, you know, the Chinese Kung Fu master. That's a typical sort of part that you pops up in all sorts of things. Didn't exist at all. And the only person who could do something like that who is somebody who really was like that. And Bruce Lee was defiant. He, he refused to allow anyone to tell him what to do. And I think the most admirable quality, uh, uh, one of the most admirable qualities about him was uh, what they said, which was he was mean to the people above him and kind to the people below, uh, that he would hang out with the stuntmen and then yell at his bosses, Raymond Chow and the American producers, uh, because he wanted things to be done just a certain way. And he, he just was defiant of anybody trying to tell him to do something different and very defiant of anyone trying to put him in the, the what he called hop along Wong roles or pigtailed coolies. This, this idea that he would play a houseboy or a, you know, a servile head bowed um, peasant. He just wouldn't do that. And so that kept him out of a lot of roles when he was in America. Um, but I think that's why he's so appealing across cultures, because you can see that sort of he's not acting when he's like, I'll kick your ass if you if you offend me. <laughs> he, re he really was that guy. Um, and that's what I think was interesting about doing his life is you can see the way who he was as a person infused every role he played on screen. I also want to ask you about his philosophy, which you described so well with so much information. And that's always one of the things that, you know, I think if you become enough of a Bruce Lee fan, you go beyond his movies, try to learn about him. And he was, he cared a lot of, about philosophy and his philosophy. He was an av avid reader and had a lot of uh, opinions uh, about martial arts and philosophy. And I, I wanted to ask you, do you, are you, are you religious? Do you have like a, any, any following? Sure. Um, uh, I, me personally, um, I was raised Catholic, Irish Catholic. Uh, of course, I spent two years at the uh, Shaolin Temple, so I have a real interest in uh, Buddhism. Uh, and so I have a, I mean, my views are, they bounce around, but I have a sort of universalist uh, view of religion, which is that it, each one is, offers a, a pathway to the divine. And it doesn't really matter which one you follow as long as you follow one or dedicated to it. And so, you know, I was very influenced by the idea of trying to um, to find a, a sort of enlightenment um, by whichever means available. And so that's sort of where I come down on it. You know, when I you know, you, you only have what's available. So I'll, you know, go to mass and think about things, but I, I, I couldn't be considered a sort of strict Catholic by any means. Uh, I kind of have a mystical uh, view of religion. And it sounds like it's, it's, it's very much Bruce like in that Jeet Kune Do mm. way that it's advancing, that you look for more. And I think that that's so well described in your book about Bruce's philosophy that he saw not just classical Kung Fu, but he extended it to all systems in any field that if you lock anything down in in a very isolated dogmatic way it it's it stops advancing and then it stops getting better and so he right. everything should, should be constantly flowing constantly innovating and he he saw this through fights in his life where he saw that you know by being locked down in a certain classical style it's not going to be maybe useful in this case where he's fighting you know a kung fu artist or or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who has this long kicks or whatever. It's like, I have to unlock myself from, 
from these uh, classical styles and move forward. And I, and I could see how he he applied this in every aspect of his life, filmmaking or or, or even his philosophy towards people. That it's like, no, I have to I have to adapt to where I am. And he he right. was in so many different places um, that worked so differently. the The culture between the West and the East, the the film industries were oh so different. So he's like, okay, I have I have to. I have to settle and adapt. I have to maybe push when I need to push, but I need to succumb when I need to succumb. And I, I have to look for my own style in this as well. I think that's exactly right. His The quote I like most from him is uh, adapt what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is specifically your own. And and I think that's very much a kind of immigrant's um, viewpoint, right? That uh, he ends up coming back to America. It's a totally different world. Uh, his parents stick him in a closet in Ruby Chow's restaurant <laughs> and he has to, he's got a whole new life. He's got to figure out how to lead. And when he goes back to Hong Kong, the movie industry is completely changed. All his connections are gone and he has to figure out how to navigate that world. And that's really what I wanted to do with the book is I think, you know, the reaction you had reading this compared to say the documentaries is they treat um, Bruce as almost a superhuman figure who you know, just automatically went places and succeeded. Um, but but the truth is, he faced daunting odds, and he had to fail many times to figure out which was the right path through. Uh, and that was what was interesting about his story, is that he he didn't automatically become a star. He spent years and years being rejected. He didn't automatically figure out how Hong Kong movie industry worked. He had to go back and be rejected and do different contracts and so um, you can watch him learn and calculate and figure out, oh, this works, that doesn't work. And even after he'd become a star, he makes mistakes. Um, he gets in a fight with Lo Wei, the, the, his, the director Lo Wei of his first two movies, and the police get involved. And he's trying to figure out how to get out of this and not affect his image. And he makes a mistake and how to deal with that. And so that's what I found fascinating is watching someone um, – you know, self-correcting mechanism, learn from his mistakes and figure out how to be better. And that's, of course, what you do in martial arts. You get into a fight and you do something, you you drop your left hand, you get punched in the face. You're like, oh, I better put my left hand back up. <laughs> like, um, And he had that sort of sense with everything. You could just watch him sort of calculate, OK, this didn't work, that worked, this didn't work. OK, I'm going to do it this way this time. And I, I, I was watching recently a video on YouTube uh, from it was called like debunking Bruce Lee myths or something like that, and uh -huh. people either I noticed go far extreme one way or then the other way. So they either praise Bruce Lee as this super god, perfect martial mm -hmm. artist, greatest fighter of all time, but then the debunkers say no, he actually was a fake martial artist. It was all for movies. He never fought right. anybody. And the great thing is about your book is that you describe how it was somewhere in between it was it was somewhere where yeah he maybe wasn't this super god he could he could beat any man on earth it kind of thing and maybe a, a lot of it was show but he was a real martial artist he did grow up street fighting in hong kong and he and he was you know on par with karate champions in the united states and you know it's d difficult to know because these guys weren't necessarily sparring and trying to beat the crap out of each other to as a duel but even today, you know, to say like who's the best fighter, it's like you could put, you know, the, the ten best fighters in 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 a ring, and you don't know who would come out top. But right, he was, exactly. um, but he was definitely among the best at yep. the, at the time. That I mean, that's undeniable. And also, I don't think people realize or remember that, you know, people might look back and say, well, you know, now if you you use jujitsu, you drop him and you put him in an R bar and et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, but that wasn't really done in in martial arts at the time. But you have to remember, like. Even just Bruce using Kung Fu and suddenly, you know, getting out of a horse stance and start hopping around and using jabs like Muhammad Ali and and right. mixing that with traditional martial arts. That was innovative. That no, Nobody had seen that before. Nobody had done that before. It, it was awkward to, for the Westerners le learning karate to see that. It was yep. bizarre for the Kung Fu masters to see that and got angry at him. It's like, what are you, you're bastardizing our, our, our martial uh -huh. arts. Um, he, he just was making everybody angry about doing it. Now people couldn't imagine not doing it. <laughs> That's right. He, I, I mean, he, uh, what I, uh, uh, to your first point, um, 
it's interesting that uh, there just was extremes on both sides of Bruce. And he's sort of a, div- in that sense, of his image has become divisive because I think some of his fans have blown him up so big that it's, you know, there are people arguing, could he beat the Hulk in a fight? <laughs> like, well, <laughs> right. Hulk, the Hulk's fictional, A, and B, no. <laughs> like, come on. He was 135 pounds and five foot seven. Um, but then the reaction becomes, well, he was he was just a movie star and he couldn't do this at all. And that's just silly. I mean, uh, one of the things from the research is the dude fought all the time. Uh, he got kicked out of Hong Kong because the police were going to arrest him for street fights. Uh, name me another martial arts actor who has that long a list of like, you know, essentially criminal activities. Uh, uh, the guy was essentially assaulting people on the street to test his Kung Fu out. And all of his students were universal that he was amazing. Uh, and the, the, the karate champions like Chuck Norris and Joe Lewis, in their hearts, they may have believed they were better, but they certainly thought Bruce was in their league because they went and studied with him and they learned from him. And Sammo Hung and Jackie Chan all described how good he was. Uh, so, you know, he was, he was one of the very, very best. He was the elite martial artist of the time. But I think the last point you stated was the most important is he was the most innovative martial arts teacher of that era because he was combining things in ways nobody at that time was doing. And we know he was innovative because what he was preaching has become what the martial arts and mixed and mixed martial arts has become. And so and I somebody asked me, you know, is he Kung Fu Jesus? I'm like, he he was a. Uh, he was MMA's um, uh, John the Baptist. <laughs> he, <laughs> it's a great, great you know, way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. The the Gracies were Jesus. They they founded mixed martial arts, but uh, Bruce was preaching that this was what was coming. Um, that you were supposed to take what was good, and he was like, "I don't care if it's a Korean kick. I just care if it works." That sort of spirit has become what the martial arts are, and I think uh, that's why he's an important as a figure in the martial arts, and. You know, no one else was innovating like Bruce was in the 1970s. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of people measure Bruce by what they see on screen, but it's not really important with Bruce to measure his art at the time. The point is, like, most martial artists at the time would probably do the same kata or form or or the the same routine of their of their style and just that one style because that was the thing to do. Just do one style and practice it endlessly over and over. And Bruce was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to incorporate everything. And so the, to measure Bruce by what we see is not really accurate. The point is that this guy, had he kept doing, going and he only lived to the age of 33, um, he w- I mean, would Bruce have adopted new techniques that we consider now basic today, like in MMA fighters, like everybody has to know an armbar? Was would Bruce have unlocked his mind to adopt that new style? Yes, and that's I think to me what makes Bruce a great martial artist. Not what because of what he was, but because if he had kept living, he would have incorporated anything. And it is the people, no matter how good they are, you might have a martial artist who's better than Bruce at the time, but would they keep innovating? Would they keep adopting these new things to expand their style? And I and. The great thing about Bruce is, and his philosophy is like, again, you can a- adopt that into anything, classical style of anything, right? Whether it be filmmaking, writing, music, you know, it's the people who innovate, bring on new things. Those are the people we, we praise. And like you say, like <laughs> he was, he was kind of the John the Baptist or the Confucius, a person who's just, you know, bringing this, this new open way of, of thinking to, to the public. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you hit it right on the head, which was uh, he was innovative and, uh, you know, you can't criticize him for not knowing something that didn't exist in his world. Um, But you can see from the very that opening fight with Sammo Hung and Enter the Dragon, that looks like a proto mixed martial arts fight. They're they're wearing tight shorts. They have fingered gloves. Uh, and Bruce like flips him a couple times and ends it with a crucifix, like a submission hold. Um, nobody in Kung Fu movies in Hong Kong were doing techniques like that. Those were things that he picked up from Judo Jean LaBelle and uh, other Judo artists. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't the greatest Judo guy because he was he preferred stand up striking. 
but he knew all these things were going on and he was very open to all of them. And that's, that's the way the world has moved. And he was right on the cusp of that. And he was preaching it and, and his sort of philosophy has become the dominant philosophy of martial arts. And that's why he's significant. I want to ask you about the cover of the book because Uh the cover of the book I found surprising because when it comes to Bruce Lee, every poster, most books, they show full form, full body, shirt off, maybe hitting a sidekick or with the nunchucks, Bruce Lee. You went with a very tight photo of him with his eyes looking right out of the corner into the camera. Why did you go with that picture? Um, I told uh, my publisher that I didn't want them to do anything that um, uh, orientalized Bruce. Um, that made him different than the way they would do a book about a white celebrity. And so the model we used was um, Simon and Schuster, which I'm very proud published the book because no major New York publisher has ever published a Bruce Lee book. Um, but they'd done a book on John Wayne and their John Wayne book had a close up of John Wayne. And then on the back had an iconic Im- image of him as a, in a Western cowboy hat, et cetera. And I was like, that's what I want us to do for Bruce treat him as we would John Wayne so that we don't, um, you know, one of the suggestions was why don't we do the poster version from the seventies with it's painted like enter the dragon. I'm like, you wouldn't do that for a white celebrity. And, and I wanted him to be treated as an iconic figure the way we would have treated anybody else. And so that's why it was important for me to, to do it that way. And also, um, I felt like, the image of him with the eyes just staring at you, those piercing uh, dark brown eyes, was who Bruce was, and we're telling the story of his life. And so I just felt that that photo captured what the spirit of the book was, which was to treat Bruce as a human being, a remarkable human being, but a human being first and foremost. Again, I, I would say that anybody would be uh, find this book enjoyable because it it's an amazing life. And I think in, especially in this day and age where race has become so important and, you know, the, the race conversation is, is open again and people are talking about discrimination. Uh, Bruce fought that and faced that and was so articulate, uh, um, uh, about it that it's really a great story f- for everything going on. And yep. the, the, the way he, he never fell into the the hate or the anger and st- and still had that uh what we call today humanism mm-hmm. of of being one family uh and i i think that that's an that's an extended message in in his philosophy his life and his movies yeah i think that's the best thing about him is that uh he didn't just uh, preach it but he also practiced it that his first student was Jesse Glover an African-American at a time when um, Chinese Kung Fu instructors wouldn't teach black students. Uh, And he was other Chinese people, his boss, Ruby Chow, told him not to do it. Uh, So he he didn't just say we should all be one family. He he faced uh, recriminations for actually acting it out. And his first group of students in Seattle was the most diverse group of Kung Fu students ever compiled because he didn't care about where you came from or what your background was or what your ethnicity was. All he cared that you were a sincere student and probably also that you listened to him (laughs) because (laughs) you like to talk. (laughs) But if you were, if you, if you could put up with Bruce philosophizing all the time, anything else didn't matter. And uh, that's the thing I think that uh, speaks to this moment in time. I, you know, one of the things I was joking with uh, someone was, you know, Bruce is America's most famous anchor baby. Um, you know, this Trump has been talking, using these pejorative terms about the uh, children born in America, something I think you could relate to. Um, and uh, that's exactly Bruce's story. But, you know, Bruce's life, think how different um, the world would be if America hadn't let him come back at 18, hadn't accepted his citizen, his birthright citizenship. Um, it would be a completely different world for the martial arts and for culture. And so um, what Bruce's story tells us is there's just remarkable things that can happen when you open the doors to all sorts of people. 
And that's one of the sort of underlying messages I hope get out from the book. I they do get out from the book and you had you had beautiful moments and well phrased in the book. I mean, if I can read the the last couple sentences from your prologue you, and it, you you start with the the funeral of Bruce Lee in yeah. in the prologue before you go on to when he was born in his life and you you describe his his uh the cemetery in the United States where Linda his wife is getting a cemetery plot for for Bruce and the owner of the cemetery says, well, do, you, do you want him in the Chinese cemetery? They had a, se a different cemetery for him. Yeah. And she wanted him, no, in a regular cemetery for where the white people were. And then at the, at the end, the very end of the, the prologue, you talk about how Jesse Glover, his African-American student, stayed behind after people had left. And you talk about, quote, when the workmen came to fill the grave, Jesse took one look of their shovels and shooed them away. It was a uniquely American moment, a black man in a suit with tears running down his face, filling a Chinese grave in a white cemetery. Jesse says, it didn't seem right that Bruce should be covered by strange hands. Mm. And I love the, that you added there. It was a uniquely American moment. And as a person who has lived abroad quite a lot and not just traveled, but actually lived in from and mm -hmm. has, has been involved in many cultures. I, I would totally agree with you with that. I do believe that is a uniquely American moment, that, that diversity. And I don't think people appreciate how unique that, that kind of um, multiculturalism is in, in the United States. And, and it said so much about what we see in, in the future in, in the book, th this moment and how he, he touched on everyone. And then he, also at the, at the end, you talk of, uh, about how the, you know, the mythos, the, this figure of Bruce Lee just cross, crossed all borders, people from different cultures. I, oh, I think one point you described how there was a theater in Iran that played yes. Enter the Dragon every day until the, the, the 1979 the <laughs> revolution. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, I love those little details, and that's what amazed me, uh, that his his films were smuggled into Eastern Europe, and they started to think of him as an anti-communist figure, and that, exactly, that in Iran, they played his films, uh, Enter the Dragon, daily, uh, until 1979. Yeah, he, uh, I, I think that's what's probably the most special. There are famous people, John Wayne, Steve McQueen, um, but Bruce uh, has an appeal that just crosses all uh, borders and ethnic boundaries. And that's, I think it's tied to very much to who he was, but also the philosophy he preached and how he carried himself in the universe. And that's what makes him special. Can, I want to go back to your research for this book because it must have been ex extensive. Did you travel? Did you have to meet with a lot of people to get a lot of this information? Yeah. So the big thing I wanted to do was to emphasize or to sort of shore up uh, his experiences in Hong Kong uh, from when he was three months old to 18 when he moved back to the States. Because most books done in English about Bruce Lee focus on his Americanness and his American experience, because, of course, it's much easier to get to those people. Uh, and I thought one of the things I could bring to this was that I lived in China, I speak Mandarin, that I could uh, get to that part of the story, which had been uh, largely ignored. So I spent about six months in Hong Kong uh, interviewing people. Uh, I interviewed over 100. And, you know, it, the, I think the Hong Kong interviews were the most significant to the book. I, uh, I had one of the last interviews that Raymond Chow, his boss at Golden Harvest, ever did. I talked with Betty Ting Pei. Uh, his girlfriend, who in whose room he died, uh, but also like some of his classmates from La Salle, the school he he went to as a teenager, uh, who had never been interviewed before, and they they could describe the way Bruce was when he was kind of a punkish teenager getting into trouble, and it gave a kind of you you get a sense of the young, the boy that became the man and the aspects of his personality that helped him and also caused him trouble later in life. Hmm. And, and um, how it took you seven years in total to write. How much of that was just research? Uh, it's about three years of it was research, um, and then I started writing. And it never really the research never really ends because you would write one a section and then realize, oh, I don't actually know which comes first, or 
this this seems thin or um, and then you'd have to call up people again and say, hey, did Bruce really say this or do you think this really happened um, or did it happen this way? A lot of stories about Bruce, like the boxing match he had as a teenager. There's like six different versions of that story. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of it is he walked in and knocked the guy out in one punch. And I'm like, that can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I finally found somebody who was actually there who had competed in the tournament. And he's like, oh, Bruce definitely won, but he couldn't knock the guy out. And it lasted three rounds. And Bruce was upset afterwards. And I was like, oh, that sounds like his fight with Wong Jack man that didn't go quite that he won, but it didn't go quite the way he wanted it to. And then he was frustrated afterwards. And one of the things you would do in writing the book is see the kind of patterns and use that as a kind of test when you had multiple versions, like, does that, does that correspond with the way Bruce acted in other examples? And that's how I sort of kind of honed down. And so that took like three to four years to, to get his story to take all that research and boil it down into a, a comprehensive book. So after I read your book, I I decided to watch the the new film, Birth of the Dragon. Oh God! <laughs> I actually couldn't watch it. I, I got through like fifteen minutes of it, and I was just like, "This is this is awful. I can't watch this." Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was just too ridiculous. And I want to ask you about you know the again the, this this image of Bruce Lee and what people think happened in his life and it's just it's so beyond what you know reality and even one jack man the obviously the interactions of him going to the tournament to see to see bruce and, and all these things never happened but just how that it starts with like one jack man like shaolin monks sitting on a mountain <laughs> meditating yeah. waterfall in the back i was like oh and i you have to imagine i watched this after i read your book <laughs> so you can imagine yeah, yeah. what i'm looking like, what am i looking at like what is this this is this is nonsense well, that, that's the thing is, and that's the example I, I would give of what orientalizing. This is a bunch of white people who sat around going like, let's make a movie about uh, some prominent Asian people and make it as most, like the most hoary stereotypes we can think of. Wong Jack Man's a Shaolin monk. <laughs> what a ridiculous. Well, he, was, he wasn't. He was not, right? I know. Yeah. He was, I mean, he was a very good martial artist who immigrated to the States and was working as a waiter. Uh, to try to make it. And he wanted to open his own school and he thought fighting Bruce Lee, uh, if he could beat Bruce Lee, he would, he would gain enough attention that he could open his own school. A totally interesting story, which if they had told it that way would have been quite compelling. But yeah, that's the, uh, I, I was in the theater watching that and there was only one other person and I start howling (laughs) with laughter (laughs) and the guy behind me goes, excuse me, sir do you know what really happened? And I was like, yeah, actually, buddy, you got the right person. <laughs> <laughs> he nailed it. Oh my God. That guy, that guy didn't know who he was talking to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've done seven years of research into this one topic. Um, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I, I think the Wong Jack man, Bruce Lee fight is fascinating. Um, just the way it uh, is. And who knows exactly how it happened, but uh, talking to everyone, I tried to get as close to the truth and it, it does annoy me when, uh, the, the people who made that movie could have done a more accurate version. They just actively chose not to. Uh, and that's just, a, it's offensive on it because it's a bad storytelling. It's not compelling as a movie and it's untrue. And it's, so it fails on every level. But yes, I think that's one of the things with Bruce is when people try to translate his story, they try to turn him into a Kung Fu movie. And even Dragon, the Bruce Lee story from 93 had that same problem where they, you know, they've got his accurate story and they're telling it. And then suddenly it turns into the dun, 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 dun. Uh, and it's a it's a kung fu battle between him and Wong Jack Man. And it's completely ridiculous and it destroys the credibility of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I even with with a uh, dragon, the Bruce Lee story. I mean, even back then, there were aspects of that movie that I knew were false, even for the research I had done. For example, that he hurt his back uh, lifting weights. I knew that. And. I see it in the movie and he's in this this underground Chinese battle in San Francisco and he gets kicked in the back by sure. you know by by a cheating other martial artist and then everybody I meet is telling me how did you know Bruce Lee hurt you know got paralyzed because he got kicked in the back in this underground fight I'm like no he didn't and he wasn't paralyzed and he wasn't in this bed where he couldn't move it at all he you know he hurt his back lifting weights but I, what I want to clarify was 
so is there any truth to the fact that Bruce did fight because other Chinese martial artists in the United States didn't like he was teaching whites? Did you find any truth to that? No. So, um, so here's the thing. There were Chinese martial artists who didn't like the fact that he was teaching white people or, or black people. Uh, and there were Chinese like Ruby Chow and they criticized him, but that's not why that fight happened. Like on the list of things that they were annoyed with Bruce by, that was probably, you know, number eight. Um, number one was he went, he gave a performance in San Francisco's Chinatown and he said the, the traditional martial artists, the old masters have no teeth. 90% of what they teach is bull. <laughs> That's why they were mad. He, he walked into their, their home uh, and insulted them and told them that what they were doing for a living and for hundreds of years was crap. Uh, and, you know, when he was 24, he was really sort of pugnacious and rebellious and he didn't care who he offended and he offended all of them. Uh, and so that's why they decided to challenge him is to try to teach him some manners basically. Uh, and it failed cause he was better than they were. And what he was doing was more advanced, uh, practically in the fighting style. But, um, yeah, so, uh, there were, so what I think happened, um, and the, just between you and me, no one's listening, of course, um, is I think he was. I think Linda went to him and said, why on earth is this happening? They just were married. She was pregnant. And I think Bruce didn't want to tell her. I, I went and I offended <laughs> all the martial <laughs> artists of San Francisco. Right. I think he said, hey, honey, they don't want me teaching white people like you. And so she, she loves her husband. She believed it. And she put it down in a book. And this became the, the legend. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's just straight up that, you know, Bruce was embarrassed by why the fight had went down. He probably said he was a little harsher than he meant to be. And so when he, when she asked him why he, he bent the truth a little bit and that's how we got the story. That's what I think happened. It, there's no way to prove it, but I, I, I feel confident that's probably the origins of that myth. So it was, so it wasn't the challenge that, you know, if you lose, you must stop teaching whites and, and blacks it, it, that it didn't go exactly down like that but there is truth to the fact that teaching kung fu unlike karate or taekwondo at the time uh karate ha had been kind of popularized after the second world war and being taught to to uh, people in in the military but kung fu in general was not taught to westerners at, at the time that was uh taboo yes and so and that's important to point out is that bruce was doing something unique um, and teaching other students, and he was criticized for it. And so they kind of conjoined that with the Wong Jack Man fight, which happened for a different reason. And it was just at this time that uh, some of the schools in San Francisco were starting to open up. And so, like, they might have one white student. Um, but there were many Chinese at the time who felt like this is is our special culture. We shouldn't share this with anyone else. It's like giving away our best, you know, you know, it's like teaching them our best technology, military technology. And so that's for real. And he did have people um, uh, later. I didn't put this in the book, but uh, there was somebody who came up to him and said, you shouldn't do this. I want to fight you. Um, and so uh, that part he was, he did face reaction against that, but that's not why the Wong Jack Man fight happened. Yeah, and and as far as um, also the the discrimination ba uh, Bruce faced in the United States, I I found the history behind that interesting because it wasn't simple just racism against Asians. It, I I, I kind you kind of forget how close it was that Bruce arrived to the United States after World War II, right. and I, I was thinking about it was, it was it was less than ten years after the second world war had ended that Bruce, I think was arriving in the United States. Yep. And, and you know, when I thought about what, well, you know, nine 11 was, was in 2001. So we're talking like, you know, 17 years ago. So that, that was much longer ago. And think about all the discrimination that's still happening today uh, mm -hmm. because of that. And then, you know, but this is world war two people often associate the United States in World War II just with Nazi Germany, fighting the Nazis, when actually most of the fighting by the United States was done in the Pacific because they entered the war because of Pearl Harbor. 
So right. though though the United States was doing uh, participating in a lot of the bombing over uh, Germany, mainly the forces of the United States were based in Australia, moving upward in the Pacific uh, towards the islands of the Philippines, uh, Taiwan, et cetera, where they had uh, the Japanese had bases. And so the overwhelming majority of the loss of life that people still remember, because you have to think like this is less than a decade that people had lost brothers, sons, fathers, et cetera. In World War II, so there was a very fresh antagonism and hatred towards Asians in general. And, uh, you know, not just at the time, but even today when I say I lived in Korea, people did have make no distinction between China, Japan, and Korea for the most part. So that discrimination wasn't just purely, I don't like you because of your race kind of discrimination. There was the a lot of the, the, the people in, in Hollywood or in the audience... Or, or even the the discrimination he was trying to overcome was the hatred towards uh, like you and uh, at the time, which is the politically correct word is Orientals. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a, a, a crucial point to understand. I mean, some of his students, Taki Kimura, one of his most important students who became his teacher in Seattle, was a Japanese American who was interned, who spent four years being locked up. Uh, during the internment in the internment camp during World War II, and so, you know, during the war, the Chinese were on our side and the Japanese were the enemy. But as you point out, uh, the average American couldn't distinguish between Korean, Chinese, and Japanese. So there was an uh, overall anti, to use the term of the time, Oriental feeling in the culture. And so Chinese actors played Japanese soldiers in World War II movies. That's, that was one of the ways they could survive. And that was the thing Bruce didn't want to do. He didn't want to be the nameless, faceless Japanese horde in some World War II movie charging the line. Um, and those were the kind of only that and being a Chinese worker in a Western on the railroads or being a houseboy. That's another thing that's culturally changed. A lot of Chinese uh, people survived by being servants in white households, uh, and that was sort of a common image, uh, no longer so. And those those were like the three parts that were available if you were an actor in Hollywood. And he was trying to create a completely different one, which was the Chinese hero. And, I, you know, executives in Hollywood, you can almost I would talk to some of them uh, and you can almost sympathize. They're like. Yeah, I, we knew what he wanted to do. We weren't opposed to it, but we didn't think anybody in the public would go along and the show would be canceled. So we couldn't we couldn't cast him in the role of, you know, uh, Kwai Chen Kane in Kung Fu. That was the impression I got, which was they were like, we would love to cast him, but we couldn't because Americans wouldn't have accepted it. And we just that's a level of discrimination. It's hard for us to remember. Yes, I, that I found very interesting also uh, in, in the book. And it was a it was a theme that kept going on and on that there was a lot of people. He wasn't just rejected straight out by every producer, every person in Hollywood, just because he's Asian. There's, there's a lot of people you mentioned, whether they be actors or producers or directors in the West who were awed by, by Bruce and thought he could carry a movie. And they want, and they, they're like, I want to get this guy into a film. But then it, you know, down the road, they, they is still in Hollywood at that time. They were making very low budget uh, flicks. If people have seen movies mostly from the seventies, they're not great usually in production value. Yeah, he, he was. Uh, I mean, one of the things he did after he played Cato in the Green Hornet and it got canceled to advance his career was he took celebrities on as his private kung fu students, and he did that primarily one for money because they were paying him the equivalent of like a thousand dollars an hour for a lesson, but uh, two so that they would give him a leg up that they would try to get him uh, parts. And they did. Sterling Siliphant, who was the uh, Academy Award winning screenwriter, wrote parts specifically for Bruce, just made up you know, the idea that there would be an Asian enforcer for the mob to get him a part in the movie Marlowe. Uh, so it worked to a certain extent, but they all, no matter how much they believed in him personally, when push came to shove, they would say, Sterling Siliphant said to Bruce, you know, you can't be as big a star as Steve McQueen because you're an Asian guy in a white man's world and it just won't happen. So even they, his closest friends didn't believe this was possible. And that's why I think Bruce is so remarkable is that he didn't believe them. 
he had such total confidence, almost delusional confidence in his ability to succeed that even when the top people in the industry who loved him to death told him it wasn't possible, he kept going and refused to quit. And that's, I think, another lesson from the book is that if you if you believe strongly enough, every once in a while, the impossible is possible. Yes. And uh, another very interesting thing that I, I love to learn fr from the book was that Bruce saw the low quality of the films he was in, even that he did, because, you know, I've, I've seen the films, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, this is this is very low quality. Do you think this is good? And it was interesting to read that. Well, Bruce didn't think it was very good. Even the movie Wave the Dragon, which he directed. Yep. Yeah, he, he was unimpressed by it. He was you describe how because it, it was a Hong Kong production that was filmed in Italy that he got very angry when he found out the rights had been sold to the West because he didn't want them to see it. He thought it would ruin his chances there and even enter the dragon, even though we look at it as this, you know, th this this is the, the, the marking moment. This is, you know, his his culmination in the industry. It, it was actually a B movie. It was given very little quantity of money. It was even it wasn't even made necessarily thinking of Bruce as the star. They wanted to have multiple stars in it. So there's there's other fighters going to the competition. They were thinking about cutting scenes down with Bruce. So the Enter the Dragon was actually just his stepping first stepping stone towards Hollywood. And and even that film, they really didn't give it much production value. It, it wasn't just that oh Bruce made bad quality films. Is that he never got the chance in any industry to really make a high production value film. But he was right after that, he was at the mark where they were finally willing to do it. And then we lost Bruce so young. I think people forget how little life Bruce had and how much he shunned in that time. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And th I really wanted to emphasize that point, which is um, Bruce himself had much bigger ambitions than the movies he made. He was making those because that was, he was essentially restarting his career. Um, and he thought enter the dragon was a, it was basically his entree. It was a, a low budget, uh, chance to show what he could do. And he planned to do the same thing again, only with 10 times the budget and a better director and a better screenwriter. Um, you know, Robert Klaus was no genius and Michael Allen, who wrote the screenplay had never produced a screenplay before. So, um, Enter the Dragon says high water mark only because he dies and we never get to see another Bruce Lee movie. But if he had continued, I think he would have been like Clint Eastwood. He would have gone on and made all sorts of different kinds of movies. I think he would have directed and I think he would have been a major filmmaker um, as well as a action star uh, because he had that kind of ambition. And when Bruce set his mind to something, he almost always accomplished it. So, one of the last things I want to ask you about, since you're a person who has also lived in Asia, you've lived in, in other cultures, you're, you're, you speak more than one language yourself, and in the context of Bruce Lee's story, have you heard the term cultural appropriation? Yes. <laughs> so cultural appropriation is very hot topic these days, and it always rubs me the wrong way. Although there might be a decent argument in some cases where they have a point, but when I see people just saying, you can't eat sushi because it's cultural appropriation, <laughs> you, like right. universities can't have yoga classes because it's cultural appropriation. You, you know, the, or the this movie shouldn't have a white actress in it because it's a Asian story. It, uh -huh. As a person who's of of mix mixture of culture, race, I you know I've also in, in, immersed myself in in Asian culture. I I think Bruce Lee is kind of the poster boy to say. That, that that idea is kind of bunk. Yes. As a person, I, I started doing Taekwondo when I was very young and I and I had to look to the to the flag of, of Korea at the beginning of the class and we would bow and we had to do everything mm -hmm. in Korean. I mean I do not feel that that is cultural a appropriation. I feel that is cultural participation. And I, yep. I think that only only made me a better person. I think it only made me more appreciative of other cultures other people's history others and, and other people in general where i now i knew something about them now we have something in common i meet a korean person and i, I was happy to say i can count in korean because we do it in, in my taekwondo class so i was right. very happy about that and encouraged me to read about 
Korean history, then study Korean um, cinema, and then move to Korea. So it, it's a, you know those small things like learning Taekwondo, like maybe doing yoga, like maybe liking sushi, sushi so much where you start learning how to do it. All those things enrich people, but now there seems to be discouraging of it. And Bruce seem to want the exact opposite of what a lot of people say today, which is no, you, you know, it, see our culture, come and participate, get embedded. There is the, we are one family and, and there is richness in everybody's technique, whether it be Greco wrestling or whether it be, uh, Gong Fu or be Aikido. It's like, no, we, you know, we have to put all this together and we are all one. I mean, that, that's not a message I'm hearing from uh today and it's very sad and personally i i prefer bruce's culture and i just wanted to know what you thought of the cultural appropriation movement yeah i i i find it um painful to watch them do this um you know there are examples where you want to be sensitive um and if there's been a long history like uh yellow face is a great example where um they they cast white actors for chinese roles like charlie chan there were a series of movies in the 60s of Charlie Chan, and it was played by a Swedish actor. And the thing is, there were good Asian actors that could have played the role. They just didn't cast them. And in those situations, I can totally see a sort of people saying, hey, look, it's Charlie Chan. You can find a Chinese guy to play that role. You don't have to cast a Swedish guy. But it's gotten um, silly, and that's what always happens when you start off with a perfectly good point, which is, um, let's be more sensitive. You know, if we have an Asian role, let's try to get an Asian actor in it. To, to criticizing, um, you know, every little aspect. Uh, writing this book, there were, you know, people would ask me, "You're white. Can you write a book about um, a Chinese guy?" <laughs> Wait, like, really? <laughs> yeah, and I was like, "Well, oh man, like." Like Bruce, like Bruce, I'm a quarter English too. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, who are we gonna find who's five eighths Han Chinese, a quarter Dutch Jewish, and uh, a quarter English to be the exact genetic match uh, to write a book about Bruce? Um, you know, you 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 either write a good book about Bruce or you don't. And you know, it, it just this kind of getting too too nitty gritty about it, so that we can't all sort of enjoy these cultures. And as long as we're respectful. Um, I think it's supposed to be an intermingling. Uh, you know, those Taekwondo instructors from Korea were not, they're not unlike the Chinese, the Christian missionaries who went over to China. They're bringing a part of their culture actively trying to get, um, a different culture to appreciate it. And that's what Bruce Lee said when he was, Ruby Chow said, you can't make Jesse Glover your student. You can't teach black people Kung Fu because they'll use that to beat us up. And Bruce's response was, they're going to beat us up anyway, but at least this this way they'll appreciate our culture and who we are. And I think that was like that was just a great, powerful response. And that's what I think is that um, everybody should be allowed to enjoy other people's culture without feeling insecure about it. I mean, th I could go on and on about your book because but I I rather people read it. And yeah. I hope I, I've read some quotes that to me were very moving. And I think we've we've touched on so many subjects where people can see there's a lot of interesting things about Bruce. It's not just he was in a movie and he did some chop sake and that's it. No, it was, there was a lot of diversity. You even go to a lot of history uh, about uh, racial dynamics with uh, Chinese and Asian people in the 20th century yeah. of the United States. There's so many things for everyone there for, if you love Asian culture, if you love martial arts, if you, you care about, uh, civil rights hit uh film anything there's there's something for people here and it again it's it's so well written and i'm especially in this podcast i got to geek out a lot and i thank you for that i <laughs> know <laughs> uh, that's my favorite thing to do right <laughs> right um is there anything you wanted to add no i think i think you hit it all uh, the the book is out it's available everywhere uh, you can visit my website, uh, www.mattpolly.com, M-A-T-T-P-O-L-L-Y.com, if you want to learn more, or see me on Twitter at Matthew E. Polly. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being on. Uh, it was a real pleasure. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the geek out immensely, so thank you.